I guess I'm curious how you shifted your priors over time on Bitcoin, because you've made a consistent case, I think, for, for many years now, essentially similar to what you just said. It's a, it's a clear position you've, hold, you've held, and you've emphasized in particular the threat of government crackdown in one yeah. way or another. Sure. And so I'm just curious if, you're, if your priors have shifted over time, because while your position is plausible and, and reasonable, it does seem that, A, the price does appreciate consistently over time, and B, Interestingly, the government seems increasingly favorable, right? You have Gensler now talking about how it's clearly a commodity. This is, you know, actually a few times he said this. There's the Lummis bill coming out. There's actually surprising amounts of positive signals coming from the government that Bitcoin so, is, is likely to be safe and that there's not much effort or energy to to demonize it or to crack down on it. So I'm just curious. I'm just curious for you, for you, Curtis. Like, at what point do you see these signals of the price appreciating consistently over time, of government actually being favorable to it? where you switch from saying, you know, before I thought, you know, most likely it would go to zero. Now I have to admit, you know, it's better than a coin flip that it goes to infinity. Um, you know, I really, I, I don't like to, and, and I don't think I ever sort of had a strong estimate on the chances of that. I don't think I'm a good, um, a good estimator of course of and that's that hard question. and but you have and, framed it as a binary so which i think is yeah interesting. sure it, it's definitely in the in the on in the limit <laughs> it's binary um but who knows where that limit is i guess i would say that there are quite a few ways of sort of in my imagined worst case scenario it wouldn't be quite as simple as okay this is banned it would be more like something creates a really strong disincentive and the disincentive has a sort of cyclical effect on the price for example you know one of the things you're gonna see certainly um you know, a good example is that, you know, a fair amount of demand for I mean, criminals, very conservative, but a fair amount of demand, you know, to hold cryptocurrency is surely fairly dark money of one kind or another. Well, it's fairly straightforward to basically for um, like chain analysis on the blockchain is not that hard. It's not that hard to imagine the banking regulators saying, okay, now we're going to publish the blacklist of addresses, okay, and you can't touch coins that have been through this blacklist. Then you're like, okay, we're going to go from blacklisting to whitelisting. So already in Coinbase for, I think, European users, they're now like, if you want to send money off, um, off, off, out, to an actual wallet, you have to basically give, you have to give the financial, the KYC information for that. Um, and so you'll basically start to see, it's really easy to imagine a system where, yeah, you have a wallet, but you can't use a wallet that hasn't been KYC to you. In which case, basically the whole world of like, oh, Bitcoin is, use, is useful for basically gray and black market financial activity completely disappears. And does that affect its sort of potential as a store of value? In some ways, not in others, um, you know, but it's sort of an example of the way, of the ways that if you can sort of hem it in and kind of get it declining, because the other thing is that basically, if you're speculating on it, you can also make money on the way down. There are, of course, Bitcoin, many financial instruments that allow you to do this. And so that also is basically a, um, it's a sort of, it's, I mean, it's a bubble in the opposite direction. It's a bet in the opposite direction. And so, you know, for example, um, there are also worlds where you can actually manipulate the Bitcoin price by basically flooding the market with futures. 
And so you flood the market, you know, you flood with the market with futures, the price drops, you buy back, right? You know, this is classic market manipulation. Right. Of course, creating a fu creating a future, a Bitcoin future in the paper belt financial system is basically indistinguishable from creating a Bitcoin. So, you know, if, as long as you're willing to have someone hold a naked short, you can still create as many Bitcoins as you like. So there's a sort of, you know, dilution in a sense that's taken up by the conventional financial system. So the Fed, for example, could create as many Bitcoin futures as it wanted, right? Because those futures would be payable in dollars, which the Fed can print, mm -hmm. right? So actually, it's not even correct to say the Fed can't print Bitcoins. The Fed can print Bitcoins. Interesting. So there uh, are these other vectors through which the establishment could essentially yeah, I mean, it hasn't, shut down it, Bitcoin. Yeah, it hasn't even like like sort of, I don't think it's really still even now because these theories are so poorly understood, I don't think it's quite on the central bank's radar as sort of an existential threat in that sense, in the sense of like, how do we keep extracting spendable money from this financial machine when everyone moves their savings out of it? Because basically, I mean, that's sort of the game. The game is that, you know, here's this giant pool of savings and, um, it's possible to basically debase a pool of savings and kind of bleed money out of it in various ways. And there's no free lunch. And if people can get their savings out of that into a different standard that doesn't leak, they will, you know, that will be a steady state. And so you can imagine a steady state in which basically essentially all savings, all financial savings are like, no, we will actually get a better return on Bitcoin than in a stable and durable way than putting them into an index fund.